Who's ready to talk about space travel? Yes, a show of hands, a nod, a fist bump. Yes, you're still with me. I know it's, we're nearing like, I don't know what time it is. I'm here from California, so it's 11 in California. It's definitely not 11 o'clock here. So as we transition into conversation around space travel, our next speaker is on the board of Copenhagen Suborbitals. Now, it's the world's only amateur organization that's trying to put a human into space. Now, he's here tonight to talk to us about why it's important to develop cheap access to space and exactly how we may be able to do that using off-the-shelf components. So please join me in welcoming, I hope you're as excited as I am, Mr. Mads Wilson. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mass, and I am a part of an organization called Copenhagen Suborbitals. And basically, we are a group of about 50 people working all in our spare time. No one gets paid. Everyone is just working for free. And what we are doing is we are trying to be the first amateurs volunteers in the world to build a rocket that can put, put a man in space. This is basically it. We don't make money. We have no business plan. We are not trying to develop any kind of disruptive technologies or anything fancy. Basically, what we are doing is we are just using technology that NASA and, uh, and the Russians developed in the 50s and 60s, and we are using components that are readily available today to implement the technology that was invented then to, big, a big rocket, to build a big, big rocket. And we are not trying to build anything very efficient. One of the problems you can say about spaceflight today is that everything has developed into a point where it, ha it needs to be very, very efficient. Because every pound, every kilo counts. You want to be able to put up a, as big satellite as you possibly can. And that is the reason why NASA, SpaceX, everyone else are building very, very efficient rockets. But what also happens when you're trying to build a very efficient rocket is then complexity increases. What we are doing is basically the same as the Germans did on the V2 missile. It's basically the same kind of, uh, of technology. We're working out of a, um, an old shipyard in Copenhagen. Uh, we have this, uh, this uh, fantastic little uh, building that you can see here. And the, this is just a little fun feature. Actually, the line you can see here is taken one night where the International Space Station just happened to pass over our workshop while we were working inside uh, building uh, rockets. I will show you this little presentation to give you an idea about what it is we are doing so that you can see that this is not all just fantasy. Thank you. 
So this was just a short compilation of uh, some of the things that we have been doing uh, for the past uh, five years. And as you can see, we do everything ourselves, everything from welding the rockets to building the launch platform to actually sewing our own parachutes. Uh, the way the, the organization Copenhagen Suborbitals work is that we don't really have any, as I said before, commercial interest. We don't have any big sponsors. We are entirely crowdfunded, so we have support members from all over the world who pays us a small amount each month, month every, everything from five to fifty dollars. And what we give back is inspiration, videos, and we share all the stuff that we actually do. But let's get, let's get back to talking about the, the launch of the actual rockets. As you saw in the video, we are launching from sea. And there's a very specific reason for this, because it is uh, insanely difficult to find a spot where you can actually launch a rocket from land. Because the land, the ground is, very, is fairly well regulated, but the air space the commercial airspace where you have all the com commercial uh, air traffic is just horrible. There are planes everywhere, literally everywhere. So we have been looking around for, or we had been looking around for a few years before we launched the first rocket to find out where is it possible to, f to, to actually launch a rocket. And what we found was that there is a, a small loophole that we can use. In this area that you can see here, just outside of the Danish, uh, Danish island of Bornholm, in the Baltic Sea, there is an old military shooting area where NATO used to, uh, or actually still, are uh, doing military exercises. This was an area that was uh, created just after the Cold War because you, NATO needed a place to show off to the Russians. So that area has been marked on the map ever since, and it, it is a mil military shooting area. Also, it is in international waters, so we have as much right to be there as everyone else. And the last thing that is very important is that it has, on the map, also drawn in a corridor with unlimited height, which means that you can actually fire a rocket and you can actually call air traffic control, the civilian air traffic control up in Malmö and say, on Thursday at 1300 hours, there will be a shot to unlimited height in ESD 139. That is the designation of the area. And they will just say, yes, sir, we will uh, redirect plane traffic. So what they do is they redirect all the commercial air traffic that comes into Scandinavia, which is a lot. They redirect that for the period while we are, while we are firing our, our rocket. Of course, in real life, it is a little more complicated than that, because we are not just sailing over there and firing what could be seen on the Russian radars as a ballistic missile. We don't do that. What we do is actually we follow a very delicate process where we, we communicate everything through diplomatic channels so that we, we are sure that all the countries around the Baltic Sea actually get the notification. And we call air traffic control in Malmö several months ahead and we coordinate with them and ask them, when would be the best time for you guys if we were to test a rocket? We actually have a rocket launch in, uh, in, a, couple, well, in a month or so, a couple of weeks to a month, uh, and we will uh, live stream everything, so you are more than welcome to, to follow us. One, when you are doing sea launches, uh, there is a lot of logistical problems involved because uh, as I said before, we would actually prefer to launch rockets on land because it's so much easier. First of all, if you test and fire and launch on land, the Earth is not moving beneath you. One of the biggest challenges we actually have on our self-sailing platform that we, by the way, also build ourselves is that the platform is actually moving. It is moving in the waves, but it's also moving position all the time, which can actually affect the, uh, the guidance systems uh, on, on the rocket. Also, we need to be able to control the rocket, because obviously you cannot stand right next to a rocket of this size once it fires. We actually need to be several kilometers away. And, uh, and uh, to do that, we have, uh, as I briefly showed on the frame before, we have our mission control ship, 
called Vostok, which is an old German rescue vessel that we bought a few years ago and, and rebuilt. The second problem is what we call PAX or personnel transfers, because there can only be a few people on the platform at, 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 at any given point, and several people need to be in several places during the, ent uh, the entire mission. So we use these uh, small uh, rescue boats to transfer people back and forth from the platform to the mission control to some of the support ships. And this is a very, actually a very, very complicated logistical maneuver to get all these people back and forth. Uh, one thing that you don't really think about when you start an organization that has the purpose of sending a man into space is that everyone needs to be trained at sea. Everyone needs to have an education, the basic education as a, as a, as a seaman. And everyone needs to train this every year because you need to be able to feel comfortable in a small boat in, in fairly high waves. So this is just one of the complexities that we have, uh, that we have uh, experienced. Also, uh, normally when you see, for example, when you see SpaceX or NASA, they have a huge control room with computers and people sitting comfortably in their chairs, drinking coffee and pressing buttons. We don't really work that way because everything we have, all our mission control, is actually aboard the ship. So every time we do this, we have to improvise a little bit. This is just, this is just the top of the iceberg. You, you can see down below, uh, we have uh, five or six guys sitting with computers, servers, wires everywhere, all built into this, uh, this old uh, rescue boat. And then we have a, a, a directional antenna that is pointing towards the, um, the platform. One little fun story is that, as I said before, the way that we get our support is by showing people all over the world what it is that we're doing. So when we launched our first rocket, we had the need, or we felt the need to be able to live stream this. But when you don't have any money, and you don't really have any equipment, how do you establish a live stream on YouTube from a ship 35 kilometers out in the Baltic Sea that is moving all the time. And by the way, it is not just from one ship, it is actually from two different ships. So the way we did that was actually we used uh, some old network equipment, some old parabolic disks, and we actually built our own wireless link, our own Wi-Fi, very, very high density beams of Wi-Fi link. Uh, and then on the island of Bornholm uh, ashore, on an old grain silo, we have a huge disk and that disk is tracking the ship out to sea all the time. And on top of the ship, all the way up, is a small antenna that is also tracking the island all the time. So that th when the ship is rotating, the antenna is actually moving. And that way, it is actually possible for us to establish a 50 megabit internet connection from a moving ship in the middle of the Baltic Sea. And that's, why, or that's how we, uh, we do our live streaming. Then we also have all sorts of homemade video mixers and stuff, but that, uh, that is a, can be a topic of another time because there are so many, so many interesting details in this. In the video before, you saw uh, one, of the, one of the first frames was the, uh, the Heat 1X, which is the biggest rocket we have built to date. What we are trying to do is really to find the simplest possible way to put a man in space. And when you're talking about the simplest possible way, you need to, you need to go backwards and, and, and look at the requirements. And the basic requirement, the only requirement that is non-negotiable is that the person you are sending to space need to survive, right? So the question is naturally, OK, what is the simplest thing we can do that will not kill the astronaut? And that was actually what we tried to do with the Heat 1X. In the Heat 1X, we, uh, we started with a capsule where the astronaut was standing up like this. A little later in the presentation, I will show you why that is a very, 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 very bad idea. We actually, in that mission, killed the astronaut twice. We killed him on the way up, we killed him on separation, and we killed him again when he hit the water. That was a very bad idea. 
But it was an interesting, interesting ex experiment, and this is what our project is all about. If you don't know, you try and you fail. It's okay to fail as long as you, you learn from it. Another thing we learned from the Heat 1X was that a passive, stable rocket is simply not good enough. If any of you don't know, I can pr briefly ex explain. A, a passive, stable rocket means basically that you have a rocket that works the same way as when you're throwing a dart. You have some aerodynamic fins on the rocket, and when the rocket is moving up, then the, the airstream on the fins will make the rocket go straight. That works if your rocket is accelerating very fast, or if your rocket is insanely straight, or if your platform is very straight. We had a rocket that was shaped a little bit like a banana, really. Maybe just only five millimeters, but still. And we were launching that from a moving platform. And it was not going very fast. So what happened was the rocket went up about two kilometers, and then it went eight kilometers sideways. So when we were standing on the ship, cheering, we actually saw the rocket coming towards us and flying over our, over our heads. And when, when we evaluated the results of that launch, we, we very quickly realized that, okay, we need to do something else. We need to develop a guidance system. We need to develop some way of actually controlling the rocket. I mean, this is nothing new. The Germans already did this, did this in the 40s. And the way you basically do this is you have, you have a gyroscope aboard the rocket, and then you have some sort of rudder system that can, uh, that can um, that can push the jet stream of the rocket in, in different directions. So we needed to develop that. We, we launched a small rocket, you also saw in the video, called Sapphire, where we tested that system and it worked beautifully. The rocket went perfectly straight up. And after that, we then decided to build a big one, because that's, that's basically that's what we like. That's what we like to do. Build big ass rockets. I mean, it's fantastic. The best thing is to have a perfect launch the next, next best thing is to have a huge explosion where everything just when goes up into flame. The worst you could ever happen is just a dot, like, <laughs> where nothing really happens. We don't want that. So we built a second version of the rocket called Heat 2X. It had a slightly, not, not slightly really, but it had a different kind of engine. The Heat 1X was a, um, a hybrid engine with a, uh, with a solid rubber cast. Uh, grain and we were using uh, liquid oxygen as oxidizer. The Heat 2X was going to be our first rocket that actually had a liquid, a bi-liquid engine using ethanol and um, and uh, and uh, and liquid uh, oxygen. And on a beautiful summer day in 2014, we had our rocket uh, standing uh, on a platform, and we were supposed to do what is called an all-up test. I have show, taken this picture uh, in the presentation to show you. You can see, if you, if you look at this, this looks very spacey, right? It looks very like something when you see one of NASA's probes or something. Actually, what you're looking at on this picture is the inside. These are the main valves for the engine. These, uh, these uh, space thingies here, they are actually uh, ordinary rescue blankets wrapped around the same kind of fabric you would use to make little ballerina girls for, for, for uh, little ballerina skirts for girls because that turns out to be a very very efficient insulation material where you can actually make a sandwich layer to prevent the wires from getting frozen by the liquid oxygen the black wires you can see here they are actually the uh, the, the right side brake cable of a Fiat Ducato it just happened that that component fitted our purpose beautifully. And it was used to, uh, to make the two main valves go, uh, go straight, to make them open at the same time. So we had this, uh, this beautiful day, you can see with the windmills and everything. Uh, the, 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 the rocket was fully fueled, venting uh, liquid, liquid oxygen, ready for pressurization. And we were ready to do our all-up test. This was the big rocket. It was going to go into space with active guidance. It was going to be fired to Mach 3, producing about uh, five kilonewtons of, uh, sorry, uh, five tons of thrust. And then this happened. Uh, 
Oh, nothing? Yeah. Let me see if I can get this video for you. What you see here is what we call pre-stage. When you, when you ignite a rocket engine, you need to ignite it in something called pre-stage first, where you put in a little bit of fuel in the main chamber before you open the valves and go full throttle. And this is uh, to prevent the engine from uh, exploding. Here you can see that was full throttle. And about a second after, remember this is high-speed video, the, uh, the inner wall of the engine actually collapsed and uh, 600 liters of ethanol came out in two seconds, created a big fire that was being fed by the 600 kilos of oxygen that was just oozing out into the engine very slowly. So everything burned. What you see here is the cable ties holding down the GoPro one meter from the rocket. They actually melted and made the GoPro fall down into the flame pit which was uh, the only reason why this uh, camera actually survived. We got a few, uh, a few, uh, a few new uh, extra cameras from GoPro because of this uh, video. Because they were, they were, very, uh, they were very excited that their, their product actually was good enough to survive the inferno of, uh, of a rocket engine. You can see it was in pretty bad shape. The camera didn't really survive, but, but, but we actually managed to get out the, uh, the SD card to get out the video. So, if, if we just, let's, let's go back to talk about the astronaut and, and what is actually needed to make the astronaut survive. You can see here, this is um, a top-down picture of our first capsule where the astronaut was standing up. Um, the reason why this is bad has something to do with the blood in your body. When you, when you exert the, the human body, to, to G-forces. You can do this in different directions. And in some directions, the body is extremely tolerant. In other directions, you will die instantaneously. And it turns out the worst thing that you can possibly do is to be standing up and be accelerated that way. No, actually, it would be sli slightly worse if you were standing on your head. But that's kind of besides the point. Uh, Standing up is very bad and being accelerated this way. And this is because when you do that, all, the, all the, the blood in your body will go down. It will simply just go down into your, into your feet. This is also why fighter pilots have pressure suits on, on their legs to prevent, the, to, to prevent the blood going down into their legs. The best thing that you can do, and this is actually why NASA and the Russians have been using different variants of the Apolloid capsule. The best thing you can do is to be lying on your back with your, in the turtle position with your arms and legs either stretched out or even better curled up like this on your back. Because then when you are pushed this way, all the, body will, sorry, all the blood from your extremities, your arms and legs, will be pushed down into your torso around the heart. And the human body can actually take up to at least 20 Gs for several minutes when you are in this position. You could also be lying on your belly, but I think that would be fairly uncomfortable. So standing up is a no-go, a definite, definite no-go. The next best thing that you can actually survive for quite some time is if you do this and sit in a cannonball position. And this is why we are right now working on a capsule that will be two meters tall and one meter in diameter, where the astronaut will be sitting in the cannonball position. Here is uh, a video uh, from the pilot's point of view in the Heat 1X rocket, in the first rocket we sent up. And you can see how we killed him. It would actually be like sitting on a jackhammer. The G-meters on the test dummy we had in the rocket showed that most of the bones in his body was broken once he got down. 
his spine was broken by the oscillation and the rest of the bones were broken when he hit the water. But it was a hell of a flight though. You can see here we have separation. The little white thing the little white thing is you can see coming out is actually small pellets of styrofoam. We added styrofoam inside the capsule so that we were sure that it wouldn't sink if something went wrong. And you can see the, the second problem we had here was that the parachute didn't really work. So uh, the capsule uh, hit the water from about three kilometers without a functioning parachute. And it, we have it in, in our museum at the workshop and it is in pretty rough shape. But even if the parachute had, had worked, this is something in the order of the experience that our astronaut will have also on this successful mission. It will not be a pleasant flight. After, after we did this, uh, this test flight and evaluated the results, we actually experimented with, uh, with, uh, with a, a, an Apollo-shaped capsule. And we actually also built one. And we did some drop tests and we did some launch escape tests on this capsule. And we, uh, at this point, we were planning to go down this way to build a capsule this size. But once we did the test, we found out that we could and can build a, cap build a capsule like this. And we can probably also build a rocket. The problem is with the tools machinery and people we have at hand, we simply cannot handle a rocket that big. It's not the question of building it. It's not a question of building a big engine. It is simply a question of handling those enormously huge tanks. That will be 1.8 meter in diameter. And that rocket would be about 25 meters tall if we were to build it. And that is simply too big. So that's why we have moved on to a, to a, um, a concept where we can have the astronaut curled up in a cannonball position inside, and that way we can actually go with a capsule that is only about one meter in diameter, two meters tall, where the astronaut can be sitting like this. One other thing that is very important is actually when the astronaut is waiting to be launched, you can see, if I can get this to work, you can see here the size of the rocket. These are all the rockets that we have built to date. The big one here is the one that we are working on. You can see how big it is compared to a human. When the astronaut is sitting on the platform, our floating platform in the Baltic Sea, that is moving a little bit. Then think about this. You will be sitting in the summer heat, 15 meters up in the air, in a steel can, on a platform that is 15 meters below you and the platform is moving. Imagine the movement that will be on top of the uh, in the top of the rocket. If you are not seasick on the platform, you will definitely get, get seasick up in the capsule. Also, you need, you need to be able to stretch and move your legs while you're waiting up there. Because if you are standing up and waiting for a long time, then you can actually go into cardiac arrest within minutes and then you will die on the platform, and that would be a pity. So we are working on a seat where it's actually possible for the astronaut to move his legs so that he, can, uh, he or she can, uh, can sit up there and waiting while the rest of us are running around and desperately trying to connect wires and find out uh, what problems uh, we need to solve in the last minute to get the rocket flying. And then once he or she have waited, the rocket will fire. And the mission is actually quite simple. What we, are, what we are planning to do is what we call a suborbital mission, which means that we are not going into orbit around the Earth. We're just flying up, passing the Kármán line, which is the official boundary to space, 100 kilometers up. Then we will separate the capsule and the booster. The booster will fall down, and the capsule will also fall, fall down and land in the ocean, and we will rescue the astronaut, hopefully. That's the mission. It all takes 15 minutes, approximately. Going up there, being accelerated for the first part of the mission to 
3.5 times the speed of sound in 90 seconds, pushing about 4 or 5 Gs. That is actually the comfortable part of the, of, the, of the ride. That's the easy part, because that's the part where we can actually control the rocket. That's the part where we are, we are in full control. We know everything. We can, we can align everything. We know where the rocket is going. Once we have main engine cut off at about 90 seconds, it will be in an altitude of approximately 50 kilometers. It will, be, it will feel for the astronaut like being kicked in the face by a horse because the engine just cuts off like this, which means no more acceleration. So it just, it just basically stops accelerating. So you will have acceleration in the different or in the, the opposite direction. But the, the rocket itself will have picked up so much speed that it will continue another 50 or 60 kilometers before the Earth's uh, gravitational pull gets a hold of it and starts pulling it down. And then the astronaut will experience weightlessness for about a minute or two. But, yeah. And this is actually a very interesting part because there's this thing about zero G that when you are in zero gravity, every kind of little weird force that you push or every little force that you access to the to the capsule or the booster will make it move in very, very different, very, very weird patterns. It is almost impossible to, to predict how it will move. So imagine this, the booster comes up, we are in zero G, we have some small explosives or springs or whatever that will pull the capsule and the booster from each other. And then the capsule will just start spinning in probably all three axes. So if the, ast the astronaut has a small window, then he will just see the Earth like <laughs> going by like, like that. Uh, then the next problem comes, because the astronaut needs to go into the atmosphere with a heat shield facing down because all the potential energy that we have put into the capsule, all the potential energy we have used to, we have, we, we have, all the kinetic energy we have, we have used to lift the capsule to 100 kilometers, that energy needs to go somewhere. We need to break the capsule down and to have it standing still or lying still in the water on the Earth. And there are only two ways the energy can go. Heat in the heat shield or as air resistance, which is basically also heat, heat in a parachute. The problem is, at the altitude we are at, at 100 kilometers, there's no air. So we don't really have any way to align the capsule. So we need to work out some sort of uh, reaction control system, something where we, some, some system that we can use with a gyro to actually align the capsule so that it will come down, the, facing the right way down. Once we hit the atmosphere, where there is some air in about, about 60, 60 air, 50, 60, 70 kilometers, then we can shoot out what is called a balut, which is actually a small, a small parachute thingy um, that will create a little bit of drag to make sure that the capsule is facing down. When the astronaut is looking out his window, he will then see these bluish and orange flames licking up the side of the capsule, which is actually partly the heat shield being burned away and partly ionized gas, simply gas, air that is so hot only due to the friction of the capsule coming down into the atmosphere. Going down from a suborbital mission is actually worse than going down from an orbital mission. We are talking eight to 10 Gs or something. This is not going to be pleasant at all. And then uh, the worst part comes. <laughs> because as I said before, going up there is actually easy. Coming, well, coming down again is also easy. We can discuss the state of the astronaut, but he will come down some way, he will come down. The most dangerous part of this entire mission is actually once the astronaut is lying in the water waiting to be picked up. Because he can easily, he can easily drift 100 kilometers from where we started. 
if the capsule hits a jet stream on its way down, or if it hits heavy winds when it's, when it's uh, falling down in the parachute, it can easily go a long way from the launch point. And remember, we are out to sea. We can, we can of course, we can, we can fly with a plane to try to locate this two by one meter object in the water, which is almost impossible. But once we have located it, we all, obviously we will have GPS beacons and stuff like that. But once we have located it, we need to get there. We need to get there with the rescue boats. And if the capsule has landed 20 or 30 kilometers away, it takes time to get there. So this is actually the most, the most dangerous part of the entire mission. And this is where we have the highest probability of death of the astronaut, is when everything is over. So you can't even say, oh, damn, now I'm, I'm landed in the water, everything went well, I'm not dead, I haven't, I haven't broken anything, because that is actually the most, the most dangerous part of the entire mission. You can see, we are, I hear we have a, well, our concept artists have uh, made a, a illustration on how it will look when, when we launch the speaker rocket from our, our self-sailing platform. I very much look forward to, uh, to, uh, to this day. Of course, we will also have to recover the booster. The booster, the rocket itself, will also go down in a parachute. We are not going to reuse it in any way. We just need to have it come down in a controlled way so we don't hit anything. One of the, one of the things that we have been discussing a lot uh, with the authorities is the question about what will actually happen if we hit something. And no one can really answer us. They can, the only thing they really can say is, if you go outside the area and you don't hit anything on your way down, nothing will probably happen. If you hit something, something will probably happen. But nobody can really tell us what will happen, because this is not very well regulated, actually, what we're doing. You can see this is an example of, of the, heat, uh, the Heat 1X capsule lying in the water. Very, very, it, it's a fairly big object. I mean, I could fit inside it. But when it's lying out there in the water, it is almost impossible to see. If there's just one leak in the capsule and it gets filled with water, then you will drown in seconds. Of course, we need to test a lot of stuff before we can get to this point. And one of the, one of the lessons we learned about in the Heat 2X fire is, was that it is really not feasible to build to be, to be cocky and to build a big-ass rocket every time. Because then you put in two years of work in a big rocket that fails, and then you need to go back and put two more years into another rocket that also fails. So one thing we, we, we realized and learned from this is that a lot of the systems, a lot of the very difficult systems that we need to develop and we need to have all in place is actually exactly the same if we are testing them on a small rocket or a big rocket. The guidance system, for example, the telemetry system, the, the gyros, all the control, everything that, that, that has to do with controlling the rocket, the parachute release mechanisms, all that is exactly the same on a big rocket and a small rocket. The computers we use for this is actually based on the Arduino platform. The, the guidance system on the rocket is running on an 80 megahertz uh, Arduino. And that is about 10 times as fast as it, uh, uh, as it need, needed to be. You could actually run the guidance system on an Arduino Uno if you wanted to. Because it doesn't need to react more than 20 or 30 times a second. And it can easily, it can easily run that, uh, that algorithm. We have developed our own version of the Arduino framework based on the Atmel CPUs, and we use a standard computer on, uh, on all our subsystems. And to test all this, to test the guidance system, to test all our subsystems, we have developed an, um, a rocket class called Nexo, which is more or less uh, the rocket world's equivalent of IKEA. You can see here, this is actually all the parts needed to build 
that rocket. Everything is, uh, is drawn in, uh, in 3D. Everything can just be sent to, uh, to a workshop that can do laser cutting. And then a week later, we can get all the parts we need. Then it needs some, it needs some milling and some, some manual handling. But we have actually tried this. And from this kit, we can put together the airframe for a next year class rocket in one week. And the material cost is around, around 5,000 pounds, roughly. What is that? That is six or 7,000 euros or something, in that order. That is the, the raw material cost for a rocket. The electronics is maybe a couple, a couple of thousand euros. Uh, the, most, the, most, uh, the most expensive part is the engine, because we have, obviously we have worked a lot to test and develop the engine, but, but, but the engine is also a component that we, can just, that we can just basically pull out of our ass now. We have made it so many times, and we have a standard engine that we can use. So the next year rocket will be the, will be the test bed for all the future flights. And it's actually quite simple. As you can see, we have the engine part down here. The, uh, the engine of the next year rocket is a small engine called BPM-5. It is about the size of a, of a large uh, thermal bottle. It produces 500 uh, kilos of thrust. It burns alcohol and, uh, and liquid oxygen. And it's made from plain steel. The rest of the rocket is basically two tanks. The avi avionics section that, uh, that contains all the radio and all, all the electronics and batteries. Then we have a parachute compartment. And then we have a nose cone that contains the little balloon. And that's basically it. So the plan right now is to build as many of these next year rockets as we need to test all the subsystems before we start testing the really big rocket. We are already working on it. We are working on the engine for the big rocket. Will be, and that, I mean, that will be a big ass engine. Uh, it will produce 10 tons of thrust. And it will burn around 3 tons of propellant in 90 seconds. 3 tons of propellant, that is, 1.5 ton of alcohol in 90 seconds. You can see here's the, uh, the next year rocket in the workshop just a few days ago. Uh, and we are making it ready for, uh, for a flight uh, this uh, yeah, next month. We will, uh, we will fly this rocket. As I said before, we have also developed an engine sp specifically for this. This is, a, this is a still photo of one of, the, uh, one of the first tests we did on the BPM-5 engine. Again, we have looked over NASA's shoulders, and we have been looking at some of the, some of the stuff that they did in the, in the 50s and 60s. The BPM-5 engine is actually a reverse-engineered version of an engine called LR-101 that uh, was built by Rocketdyne for the, uh, for the Atlas ballistic missile. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that, but uh, when you see the Atlas missile launching, you can, you can look it up on YouTube. There are two, sma two small jet streams coming out the side of the rocket. It, it, it looks very strange. That is actually small guidance rockets that are used to control the, the motion. And that is the LR-101. And we have reverse engineered that one, that engine, and made it a lot more simple. And that has become our, our BPM-5 engine, which has proven to be extremely reliable. The first uh, engine that we ever built had huge problems with the tolerances. And we literally put it together using a hammer and an anvil, old blacksmith style. And that engine, that particular engine, has been fired over 30 times, and it's still working. You can see here on this video one of the tests we did. This test, this particular test, was to evaluate if graphite or copper was the best for jet vanes. Graphite won, as you can see here. The reason why the flame is green is actually be because the copper burned. It didn't just melt, it actually burned in the engine. That engine is 2600 degrees hot on the inside. 
so it got so hot that it actually burned away the copper. So now we are using uh, graphite for, for jet veins. The next emission will also be quite simple. As I said before, the only thing we need to do, the only thing we need to test is to repeat this pattern because this is similar, even though we are, not, we are, we are only getting up to about 10 or 12 kilometers. But this is actually comparable to the final mission that we will be doing. So we are just going to repeat this mission again and again and again until all the subsystems, all the computers, everything works as, as expected. And then we will start, start implementing them on the, um, on the big rocket. One, uh, one area where we haven't had much luck is parachutes. And one of the reasons for this is that there is, in the European Union, I think, but at least in Denmark, there is a weird uh, thing about regulations that when you build a parachute, when you have something that you need to drop in a parachute, you need to have a parachute that is scaled for the load you're going to drop. If you drop a rocket the size of Nixu in a G11 military parachute designed for tanks, it would be like blowing a dandelion seed in a, in a hurricane. It would just <laughs> go somewhere or fly sideways or whatever. You need to have a parachute that is actually the correct dimensions for the load you need, you need to carry. You cannot really buy that. So as you also saw in the, in the, uh, in the first video, we need to sew the parachutes ourselves. But. It is illegal to do a drop test of a parachute using something that is not a human. You cannot take a bag of potatoes and attach a parachute to it and drop it from a plane. That is illegal. The only way you can test a homemade experimental parachute is actually to have a guy jump out of a plane using your own homemade parachute. And this is where Ahmed comes into the picture. He, uh, he's a parachute instructor and a very brave man. And he has actually volunteered to test all the parachutes that we are, that we are building. So what, what he, do, and he does this every summer. What he does is actually he jumps out of the plane with three parachutes. Our test parachute, his own main parachute, and his backup parachute. So he jumps out of the plane, and then he flies in our parachute for a couple of minutes. He releases that, and then he comes down to the Earth in his own parachute, which means that we afterwards need to take a car and drive out in some cornfield somewhere in the middle of nowhere to pick up that parachute that has landed in a tree or something. But this is actually, an, I mean, you can fly a rocket, you can build a huge rocket and fire it from a platform that you built yourselves, but you cannot test a homemade parachute unless you are testing it, testing it on a human. One of our good, uh, one of our good uh, collaboration partners um, have just done a high altitude balloon experiment in Australia. And he said that it was actually easier to get a permit to put a human in a high altitude balloon than it was to put a rat in the high altitude balloon. It makes sense when you think about it, because it has something to do with consent. You cannot ask the rat if it wants to go into space. But, you, but, but a human can give consent, and you can have witnesses that will tell you that you are not insane. And this is also why we can, ask, we can actually do this without any problems. Because if you are not mentally ill, I guess you have to be a little mentally ill to do this, don't you? But if you are not in a, in, a, in a medical way mentally ill, then you can actually give consent and be flown into space on the rocket that, 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 that we built. But yeah, this parachute stuff is a fun story. Um, originally, it was uh, it, our plan was to launch the first next year rocket last year. We had some technical problems, uh, so it didn't really happen. And I'm very sad because, as I said before, we are crowdfunded. All the money we have is something we get from people like you all over the world who donate every month. Uh, and last year, we got the best publicity we possibly could. 
because the first Danish astronaut, Andreas Mogensen, uh, went to the space station and he actually used the space station's uh, inkjet printer to print out this little uh, picture of Nexo and took uh, this picture in the, in the cobbler section. And we have that in the workshop framed and he sent this on Twitter on the day that we were supposed to, to fly the next rocket. So I'm very sad that we, that, we, that, we didn't, uh, that we didn't get to do that. But hopefully, hopefully we will uh, in, a few, uh, in a few weeks. And I encourage all of you to go to our website, to follow, sign up to our newsletter, whatever, and follow uh, our live, live stream to see our, our struggle with the elements when we are going to, uh, to fly the, the next uh, rocket. And one thing that people sometimes ask me when I talk about this is, but why are you doing this? Why, 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 why do you want to go to space? And the best answer, I, I have thought about this a lot, the best answer I really can give you is, well, because it's there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. It, it does take a special kind of crazy to, to yeah, I love it all. Yeah, One can, more round I, of applause for I can see you're keeping Mads, your please. distance there. Oh, no, I'm, I'm a skydiver, <laughs> so when you put the parachute guy up, I was like, yes, I, maybe not like with just yours, yeah, oh, perhaps oh, oh. with other parachutes. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity to do Q&A on stage. However, please, I'm sure I saw a lot of eyebrows raised and a lot of inquisitive looks. So please make sure you connect with Mads off stage to ask as many questions as you'd like. And what was the site again, Mads, for them to check out? Uh, it's www.cupsup.com. Awesome. Please do check it out. And we are coming up on our grand finale experience for you all. So I would advise that you stay really close. We're kicking off at 9 p.m. There's going to be a media performance that you all will take part in if you're seated here. So sit tight, and we are going to close things out on the main stage here tonight in just five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>